right, everybody, let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Father, I pray as always that this message is a message that you got to have for your people. May the proud amongst us be humbled, but the humbled lifted up. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray this. Amen. We are right in the middle of a sermon series. My wife and I took a trip. You know, uh, forgive me. Bill, can you run me down that, uh, the clicker? Forgive me. Uh, my wife and I and the kids took a trip to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky. And thank you, Joan. Uh, to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky. And if you ever get a chance, uh, I highly recommend that you guys go. It was brilliant. And the, there's a creation museum there as well. And that spurred my thinking to do a sermon series on worldview. This is now number three in that series on worldview. What I mean by worldview is this how you interpret the events and the circumstances of this world. For example, uh, Scott talked about his electric fence and he meandered in almost nonsensical ways, but we came to the conclusion <laughs> that we don't control anything, but that God is in control. Would that, would that be right, Scott? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Scott came to that conclusion, and he told you that conclusion because of a particular worldview. He is interpreting the events, and we are interpreting the events that happen. It's processing through our worldview what we believe and how we interpret these things. Have you ever noticed that the same event can happen to two people? They can both experience the identical event and have wildly different reactions, beliefs, and ideas about the event that they both experience. That's because of their worldview. So a worldview is a concept of how I interpret and understand the world around me. Every experience I have is interpreted through my worldview. By the way, it happens very quickly. You're not even thinking about it. But it's, it's going through your worldview. So the biblical worldview, this is the third time we're talking about this, but I want us all on the same page very quickly, is on the left there. I know that it's small. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day of that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Whether you know it or not, if you have a biblical worldview, these concepts described on the left-hand side of the screen absolutely frame every single experience in your life. You believe that there is a God, and this God is outside of time. Whatever the whole show is, if the whole show is all of natural things, all things created, you believe that God stands outside of that, quote, whole show. God created the heavens and the earth. Then furthermore, you believe that you and me, black, white, rich, poor, old, young, male, female, are the apple of God's eye. That you are created uniquely amongst all of the creation. That you are different from the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the field. That you are created by God in His image. In addition, you believe that the creation was very good. And that the creation as originally created was perfect and lasted forever. The reason we have such a disgusting, sinful world filled with hate, greed, war, famine, cruelty, death, disease, is not because God created it that way, but because sin entered the world through the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Now, whether you know it or not, every event that happens in your life gets transmitted through that worldview. And you interpret every event through those 
fact. As opposed to this is the worldview of the secular world. It's the worldview of the Natural History Museum. It's the worldview of biological, biology professors. It's the worldview of our public education system. It's the worldview of all these people with lots of fancy letters behind their names. This definition comes from the National Association of Biology Teachers. I did not make it up. This is their definition. The diversity of life on earth is the outcome of evolution. An unsupervised, impersonal, impersonal unpredictable, and natural process of temporal descent with genetic modification that is affected by natural selection, chance, historical contingencies, and changing environments. That's a fancy definition to simply say, let's just take it one step at a time. Everything that you see, the sun, the moon, the stars, the cosmos, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the field, and you are an outcome of billions of years of replication that is unsupervised. If something is unsupervised, what does that mean? Not directed. No one's in charge. Impersonal. There's no relationship between the creation itself or anything outside of the whole show. Undirected. Unsupervised. Unpredictable. No order in it. It only appears that there's order. Completely unpredictable. And it's a result of natural selection, billions of years of death and replication, so that you are no different in value. All you are is a highly evolved polar bear. You are just a biological animal in a universe where no one is outside of the whole show. That's the worldview of the secular world. These two worldviews cannot be in symbiosis. They do not connect. Now, these two worldviews have tremendous, tremendous effects on this word. Hope. Two humans born to the same two parents, living in the same house, one believing the worldview on the left, the other believing the worldview on the right, will have drastically different ideas of this word, hope. We use the word hope most of the time like you might use the word wish. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. I hope hope I don't get COVID. I hope I have a fun birthday. In all three of those sentences, the word hope is nothing sure, right? You're not sure of it. You just wish and you want those future things to be true. But do you know that the naturalist, the person with the worldview on the right, the naturalist can't even use that word even almost like that. There is no hope to the person with the worldview on the right. You know that every single scientist acknowledges that the universe itself is dying. I'm not a scientist, so I might bungle this up a little bit, but it's called entropy. And a, a layman understanding this, everything has energy, and eventually all of the energy is going to what? run down. The sun, they put a year on it. Eventually, what's the sun going to do? It's going to go. This earth eventually is going to what? Wear out. Everything runs down. Apparently, their only hope if all they are is a biological animal, what does every biological animal in this whole show do? Dies. And when that human body loses energy, what does it do? It rots. 
Everything's dead. This is why, have you ever noticed, secularists are always worried about their legacy because that's all they've got. I just want to be remembered. You know what? I could care less if anyone remembers me. Save one, well, three persons. Because the secularists, when they die, they rot. This is, if the worldview of the right, uh, by right, the right side of the screen, the evolutionist is correct. The universe will eventually undergo a, quote, heat death when all usable energy has been used up. All life will end. Indeed, all chemical, biological, and physical processes will cease. It'll be a long time from now, but nevertheless... The whole thing, what? Ends. The whole thing dies. Eventually it's all gone. This is a quote from Christopher Hitchens, who, is, who was a famous atheistic philosopher. He's now since died. And even before his deathbed, he wrote a book on why he won't believe in God. So he died in his atheism. Sadly, I wish... For his sake, what he believed was true. Honestly. Because he now knows what he taught and believed is not true. And he's the worst for it. He wrote, We don't particularly welcome the idea of the annihilation of either ourselves as individuals. The party will go on and will have left and we're not coming back. Or the entropic heat death of the universe. We don't like the idea, but there's a good deal of evidence to suggest that is what's going to happen. That's the worldview of the evolutionist. And it helps explain a lot of what's happening in our world. Take this as an example. Do you know what those are? Those are cryogenic tanks. Do you know what's inside those cryogenic tanks? Dead human tanks bodies. Listen to how stupid this is. People die. They quickly get cooled down till finally they get so cold that at a a negative temperature, cells no longer decay. And they get stuck into the tubes in the hopes that hundreds of years from now, maybe millennia from now, a cure will come along. Their dead bodies can be heated up. They can be brought back to life. And whatever disease killed them can be cured. How pitiful and ridiculous is that? Do you know that that's very popular for the rich and famous? The cryogenic freezing of their dead bodies. This is what the evolutionist has come to. This makes perfect sense, by the way, if evolution were true. That is your only hope of survival. Your cryo death and tank. Have you ever wondered why the world fears, absolutely fears death? Absolutely is petrified of it. Nobody likes death. Death is ugly. Death is painful. Death is indeed a separation. But have you ever wondered why the world fears it so much? Absolutely petrified of it. Because to the world, death is what? The end. To the world, death is annihilation. For the world, there's no hope. It doesn't matter how many letters you have behind your name. It doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what gender you are. If you really are an evolutionist, you have no hope. You die, and what? And that's it. 
But for the Christian, we have hope. Hope is one of the three virtues of faith, hope, and love. Hope is a cornerstone. What makes a man say this phrase? What is the world petrified of? We don't hasten it. We don't wish it because it isn't evil. But how could a man write to die is what? Is gain. How could a man write to die is gain for me? Because he wasn't an evolutionist. That's how. He had a different worldview. He wrote this from prison. This is the Apostle Paul. People were worried about his possible martyrdom. And he basically said, hey, guys, don't worry about it. For to me, as far as I'm concerned, to live is Christ. If it's going to do more for the gospel for me to be in prison, come on, prison. Come on, prison. For, for to me, to live is Christ. And hey, if they kill me, <laughs> to die, what is gain? Let me tell you why it's so important. The world and all those fancy people with all those fancy letters behind their name. I mean, we hear it all the time. I'm not, I'm not diminishing mitigating factors in loving your neighbor. Yet, what are we constantly told? Just the drumbeat, the drumbeat. Listen to what? What are we being told all the time? Follow the what? The science. Listen to the science. Follow the science. The science has the answers. Well, you know what the science tells us about this? For me to live is for me and those I love, and to die is the end. Follow it. Straight to hell. I'm not interested in simply following the science. I'm interested in following Jesus Christ. That does not mean that I think low of science. What I think that means is science does not have the answer for what? Life. For to me, this is science's thing. To live is maybe for me and for those I love. And to die, what? What do the guys with all the letters behind their names tell you? Death is what? It's the end. That's what they tell you. Let me tell you why it's so important to know that God is outside of time, that he is the creator of all things visible and invisible. Because even though we've sinned, and due to that reality, this entire creation is indeed going to end. This is where the scientists are right. They've noticed what God told them. Have you ever noticed scientists work really hard to climb up a mountain and the theologians been up there the whole time? They finally came to the conclusion, hey, this creation is dying. If they would have read Genesis chapter 3, I could have told them that. My 10-year-olds could tell them that. You know, that's a lie. My 4-year-old could tell them that. Genesis 3 has already told us this world is what? Cursed. Everything's going to what? Die. You have now, with your entropic principle, made it to the level of my four-year-old. Okay. We have a God that made this creation out of nothing and has promised to make a new one completely perfect and free from sin. He did it once. Therefore, if God does it once, what does that mean? He can do it again. And he has promised to do just that. Except for the second time, there will be no opportunity for sin because the time for choosing was in the sinful world. That's why the Apostle Paul could write what he wrote. That's why I don't weep uncontrollably over my dead father. I don't weep uncontrollably over sweet, beautiful Betty. That's 
why I don't weep uncontrollably. One of the saddest days of my life. I'll never forget it. I, I'll never forget it. Now, I understand that I don't process grief normally. I do. I really do. But the saddest day of my life was when I took my two little girls to go see their little sister. And my wife had a sonogram. And then all of a sudden, that little baby's heart on that sonogram wasn't beating. And that little baby was dead. And my wife covered her face and began to cry and said, what did I do wrong? Then I started to cry. Then we had to spend the next two days with our dead baby in her womb. And then she had to have a procedure where they evacuated the dead baby out of her body. And they called us later to say that she was going to have a little girl. I cried that day. Haven't cried since for baby Grace, though. You want to know why? Because of my worldview. What I know is that Jesus will create a new heaven and a new earth. And my last breath here will be my first breath there. And after I'm done blubbering all over Jesus, <laughs> he'll hand me my little baby girl and he'll say, this is your little baby Grace. And I'll smell her and she'll have that new baby smell. And I'll kiss her. My old man is up there right now talking to Jesus. Sweet loving Betty is up there playing notes to Jesus. But I only know that because of my worldview. The evolutionist, my dead baby, is just dead fetal tissue that we can use for medical research. My dead father is still taking a dirt nap in a grave. And poor Michael will never see Betty again. That's the evolutionist. Now that's something to cry over, isn't it? That's something to weep over. Hope. There's that word again. To the Christian... Hope is not a wish. To the Christian, hope is certainty of a future event based upon the promise of Almighty God. A certain reality that lies in the future. You don't hope for what you have. Certain due to the promise of God. What can God not do? Lie. So if God makes a promise, what? Bank on it. And he made a promise. We are waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved. The scientists have got us that far, haven't they? But the next part comes based on the promise of God. And the heavenly bottles will melt as they burn, but according to his promise. The scientists all acknowledge it's going to be a big heat death. ha <laughs> ha! You're right. But according to his promise, of which he cannot lie, we are waiting, what? For new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. God has made a promise, and the promise is this. This sinful world is not it. I will make a new heaven and a new earth, a home of righteousness. You want to know what this picture proves? Everlasting life. Our Jesus died a death that we all deserved. And in that death, he took on all of our degradation, all of our iniquity, all of our sin, all of our corruption. But then he rose again. He defeated death. So death no longer has mastery over him. 
Let me make you a promise. And it's not, please don't believe it just because I say it. My goodness. Don't base your hope on me. Believe it because Jesus says it. You will die. I know not when. I know not how. But you will. You will rise again. When Christ comes back, you will rise again. And if you trust him, he will take you to be with him forever. Amen? God is good all the time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. We thank you for the promise of everlasting life, for it gives us real, authentic hope. Help us to put our hope in you and in you alone. In the name of Jesus, amen.